James chapter 1 as we continue our study of the fruit of the Spirit. This is a summer morning series in which we're seeking to address and clarify some of the confusion and answer some of the questions dealing with the Holy Spirit. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 1, let we stand in honor of God's Word. Today we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit called joy. James chapter 1, I'd like to begin reading at verse 2, and I'm reading from the New King James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And then turn with me, please, back to Galatians chapter 5, and I'd like to begin reading at verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You so much for the privilege of gathering at Your footstool around Your Word. And we ask that Your Holy Spirit would do the ministry which He alone can do, and that is to open Your Word to our hearts and impart to us spiritual understanding. And Father, we ask that Your Spirit would not only give us understanding, but give us wisdom that we might walk in the fruit of joy. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Concerning joy, William Barclay, a Scottish pastor of another generation, made this statement. He said, we are chosen as Christians for joy. However hard the Christian way, it is both in traveling and in the goal of our Christian life, the way of joy. There is always a joy in doing the right thing. When we evade some duty or some task, when at last we set our hand to it, joy comes to us. The Christian is the man of joy. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. And nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its connection with long faces. Amen. In England, if you go there and tour London, They will take you by Buckingham Palace and they will alert you that if the Queen of England is in residence there, that her personal flag flies over Buckingham Palace. If she is not in the Buckingham Palace, then her flag is wherever she is, in any one of her multiple castles that she owns in England and in Scotland. In that tradition... Biblical expositor Walter Knight makes this statement. He says, Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence there. Amen. When Jesus is sitting on the throne of our hearts and filling and empowering us with His Holy Spirit, the joy of the Lord will become a reality in the life of the Christian. In our series on the fruit of the Spirit, we have discovered that the Holy Spirit is God, that He is our loving companion and Lord, and we've also discovered 
that He is the one who produces in us the character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ, which you and I know as the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, this Spirit who produces this fruit in us is the Spirit of Christ. And His job is to build in your life and in my life the character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you and I, as we walk more and walk longer with Jesus, look like Jesus, talk more like Jesus, behave more like Jesus, trust God more like Jesus, and so forth. That's His job. As we have been talking about the fruit of the Spirit, last week we discovered that The fruit of the Spirit is a cluster. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the meekness, the temperance. All of that goes together. No one can say, I didn't get all nine of the cluster of the fruit of the Spirit. I only got eight. I didn't get patience. So don't expect me to be patient. Uh, You get all of the cluster of the fruit of the Spirit. God wants to produce all of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. It doesn't happen overnight, but as you and I walk more with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will produce this cluster of character qualities in our life. We also noted that the fruit of the Spirit are supernatural. This is not a love that you can produce. It is not a joy that you can gin up. If you can produce any of the fruit identified in Galatians 5.22, then it ain't of God. It's not supernatural. God wants to produce that fruit in you. He wants it to be supernatural so that He gets all the glory. And Jesus is manifesting His life through you and me on a daily basis. All right, let's look at that fruit of the Spirit that we know as joy. We discover in the Bible that this joy is not of you, it's not of me, it is of the Lord. Let's read together Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, please. Everyone together. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's not the joy of the pastor that's your strength. You're in a hospital someplace and the pastor visits you and encourages your heart, shares a scripture and prays with you, and you feel better. Well, that's wonderful. But if it's the joy of the pastor, then when the pastor leaves and the next time the phlebotomist comes and has to probe for that vein, you're going to lose your joy. So it better be the joy of the Lord. Plus, when you are in crisis, you need the strength that that joy imparts in your life. Also, we discover that the fruit of the Spirit called joy is of the Lord Jesus. We see this in John 17, 13 and in other places as well. Would you read that together with me, please? These things I speak that they may have my joy. Jesus wants you to have His joy because that's the only joy really worth having. So He wants you to have His. Now, that's very special to me. Jesus says, I want to so much be your life that you can share with me my joy. I want my joy to be in you. Now, we also know that he wants us to have his peace too, doesn't he? So he wants you to have his joy. He wants you to have his peace. Not a duplicate, not a counterfeit. His joy. That's special. And then third, as we already know, this joy is of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 14, verse 17, let's read that, please. For the kingdom of God is peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, we already knew that joy is of the Spirit because it's called the fruit of the Spirit. But this is just one more. There are many verses. It's kind of hard to figure out which ones to use and which ones to leave out because they're all so good, but that's just one more. This joy is of the kingdom of God. God wants all of the citizens of His kingdom to have it. He wants all of His kids to have it. And it's of the Holy Spirit. All right? The focus of 
the joy of the Spirit is the Lord. The focus of that joy that we're calling the fruit of the Spirit is the Lord. This is critically, critically important. I'm so glad that our students were in the first service this morning because they already know the difference between joy and happiness. At their age, what a blessing that they can know the difference and not waste valuable time and energy seeking the fool's goal of happiness when joy is available to them in the Lord. All right? Now, the focus of joy is always the Lord. In Philippians 4.4, 4, let's read that together, please. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, Paul doesn't say rejoice in your paycheck. And again, I say rejoice, because a lot of you are not happy with your paycheck. Probably. Oh, you're all happy. Okay, that's good. That's good. Didn't know that. Um, he didn't say rejoice in your arthritis. Uh, he said rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice always in the Lord. Now, there's a big difference between happiness and joy. And those of you who've sat under my ministry, this is old stuff for you, but it won't do you any harm, all right? Um, happiness is circumstantial. It always has been circumstantial. It always will be circumstantial. It cannot be anything but circumstantial. The word happiness comes from the root word hap, H-A-P. It means coincidental or it means uh, without rhyme or reason. The word happenstance, what is happenstance? It means without rhyme or reason. It just kind of happened. Well, there's the word happened. Happen. It just happens. Okay? So, happiness is a happening that is haphazard. It just is there. It's your circumstances. Now, let's get something straight. I don't think God is opposed to happiness. But that is not a goal in His life. Your happiness. Contrast that with a lot of human beings who make happiness the goal of our lives. We will do anything to be happy. Well, there are a lot of people in Hollywood who will do anything to be happy. And are they really happy? Most likely they're not. Because circumstances shift and change. Anybody who pursues happiness as an ultimate goal in their lives are pursuing the pot at the end of the rainbow. Now, when circumstances are advantageous, they're like we want them to be, then you can be happy. Re be happy in the circumstances. Delight in the circumstances. And that's okay. But your joy is not based upon your circumstances. Because what circumstances can give, guess what circumstances can do? Take it away. Exactly. You can just be happy as a lark, sun shining, birds are singing, everything in your world is hunky-dory and okay, and one person can come up to you and say something to you, and all of a sudden it's gloom and doom. You lost your happiness. One person has stolen your happiness. Has it ever happened to you? It's happened to me. That's how ethereal happiness is just not permanent. So enjoy it while you have it, but you don't try to hold on to happiness. It's like trying to grasp a cloud. Anybody can steal your happiness. Nobody can steal your joy. No man can steal your joy. Then how can I lose my joy? You lay it aside. You lay it down by choosing to lose your focus. Your focus is the Lord. In fact, I would even say that wonderful, happy circumstances may be one of the greatest threats to joy that is out there. And I know that sounds weird, but just think about it for a moment. If joy is 
focusing on the Lord, when you're in trials and tribulations, many times it's easier to get on your face and seek the Lord because things are hard and tough. Okay? But when the birds are singing, the sun's shining, and everything is hunky dory and you're singing zippity doo da then it's so easy to take your focus off the Lord and put Him on your circumstances. And the longer you live focusing on your circumstances, then when a trial comes your way, what are you going to do? By default, you're going to tend to focus on your circumstances. Because what you do every day in practice is what you and I tend to do in the game of adversity. So the more I focus on my circumstances and enjoy the circumstances the more likely I am to stumble and find it more difficult difficult to focus on the Lord when things are difficult and hard, trials and tribulations. So I'm not putting down happiness, but I'm saying don't settle for happiness when you can have God's joy. Number two, don't let happiness cause you to cease the discipline of focusing on the Lord. In other words, when circumstances are going great and you want to jump up and click your heels, say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving me these wonderful circumstances. They're from you, and I rejoice in you, and that circumstances are delightful. But my joy is in you, Lord. In other words, the more independently you can live of your circumstances on a daily basis, the more consistently you'll know the joy of the Lord. The more you live in a dependency upon your circumstances, the less likely you will be able to capture, or even probably better put, be captured by the joy of the Lord in the midst of your trial. Okay? Are you with me? All right. So there's a difference between happiness and joy. Don't miss the difference. In fact, I would say uh, we just need to check ourselves. And when you've got a loved one who's down in the dumps having a pity party, just lovingly ask them, have you lost your happiness or lost your joy? There are several Old Testament words that are translated joy or to rejoice. And uh, one of the root words of one of those words means to shine. I kind of like that. What puts out more shine? Me lighting a candle right here with all these spotlights down here on the pulpit, putting this light out, or me coming back about midnight tonight, don't turn on any lights and light that candle. What puts out more shine? Well, I guess technical, uh, they puts out the same amount of light. But I mean here in the room... What's going to shine more? The light or the darkness? In the darkness. I realize that probably was never clear. In the it was not a trick question, believe me. So if 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 the joy of the Lord shines and radiates, it's going to have a greater impact on anybody watching and observing your life in a trial and its darkness than on the mountaintop when the sun's shining and the bird is singing. Now, I'm not saying it won't be noticed. It will be noticed then, too. But the, the, sh- the shining of the joy is greatest in the deep, deepest pit. It's not what you want to hear, but it is true. So, in a sense, the joy of the Lord can have a more significant impact on your life and the lives of those who are watching you if you know the joy of the Lord as a fruit of the Spirit in the midst of life's trials and tribulations. All right? But there's, there's a root word means to shine. Another root word means to be glad. Another root word means to leap or dance. I've been so happy in the Lord, so joyous in the Lord, that I just wanted to dance. And I did behind closed doors. I danced. My feet would not remain still. Well, I guess I could have. You will remain still. But they wanted to dance. Now, it's it's one thing to dance on the mountaintop. It's something else to be in the deepest pit and the joy of the Lord rise up within you 
and you just dance before the Lord with tears streaming down your cheeks. Folks, that's when the joy's got a hold of you. That's a supernatural thing. There's a New Testament word translated joy, which means gladness, delight, and joy. Now, as I look at those words, I can see some emotion there. Gladness, delight, joy. Delight is not necessarily an emotion, but it can be. Joy, gladness, to leap or dance usually reflects some emotion. But I want you to understand that the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit is not primarily an emotion. And if you feel like you've got to gin up the emotions or you don't have the joy of the Lord, then I think you're being deceived. You can have the joy of the Lord in the midst of the deepest, most heartbreaking circumstances of your life. You can have the joy of the Lord with tears, and you can have the joy of the Lord with shouts. I've known people in the midst of tribulation who had the joy of the Lord who couldn't stop laughing. Bless you. Who could not stop laughing. I'm serious. You would think that they've lost it. They have lost it. This is totally an inappropriate situation to be laughing in. They can't stop laughing. It's, they've got uh, the joy of the Lord's got them. Right. But the joy of the Lord is a settled disposition. It is a mindset as much as anything that the Holy Spirit can cultivate as you allow Him to do so. Uh, in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18, I want you to see that Habakkuk has the joy of the Lord in the midst of absolute desolation. All right? Let's read that together, please. Though the fig tree not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, and the fields yield no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Folks, have you ever been in a desolate place where the vine put out no fruit, there was no food in the fields, the flock were cut off? From the fold, the figs had dropped off the fig tree. And you said, woe is me. The locusts have eaten. And I am desolate. I, have, I, I bet most of you have been there at one time or another in your life. In other words, you had absolutely nothing to be excited about. You were devastated. Habakkuk was there, and yet in the midst of all this devastation, he had absolutely nothing. And he said, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. When you're in that situation, it's when the psalmist, it's like when the psalmist said, Whom have I in heaven but thee, and on earth I desire nothing. Because you don't have anything but the Lord. But if the Lord's all you have, you've got more than enough. <clears throat> One of my dear friends is Dr. Al Meredith, pastor of Wedgwood Baptist Church. After that tragic Wedgwood shooting in which a number of students and adults were killed by that gunman, my pastor Al, my friend Pastor Al Meredith was being interviewed by the press. And Al quoted this passage of Scripture. In the midst of that great, devastating, tragic, heartbreaking situation that could have destroyed that church, Al Meredith was the shepherd whom God had appointed for that time and hour in the life of that church. He quoted this verse. This was the first scripture I heard from his lips as he was being interviewed. Al Meredith understood that the joy of the Lord is our strength. 
And because he understood this, he declared this to his people over and over and over and over. We will rejoice in the Lord. We will joy in the God of our salvation because we don't have anything else to be excited about. And that church has survived that great tragedy. And it is thriving because their joy was in the Lord. So the focus of our joy has got to be the Lord. It is a settled disposition. Now let's talk about that settled disposition. The fruit of the Spirit called joy rejoices that God is sovereign. It rejoices in the depths of its being that God is sovereign. And unless you can rejoice in God's sovereignty, you will not have the fruit of the Spirit called joy. In Revelation 19.6, as you have been reading through the book of Revelation, when you get to chapter 19, Satan is pouring out hell on the earth, trying to destroy the people of God. God is pouring out His judgments on the earth, trying to bring sinners to repentance. And literally, there is what appears to be gargantuan chaos in all the earth when you get to chapter 19. And in the midst of all of this upheaval and what looks from the human perspective to be utter chaos, comes this beautiful and sweet refrain. One of the most important verses in all of the Bible. Let's read it together. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and give the glory unto Him. Folks, when your world looks like it's literally coming apart and the mountains are rushing down into the sea and things don't make sense, that is when you can anchor your soul and take solace and discover the joy of the Lord in the sovereignty of your God. Now, I've heard pastors try to extricate God out of the worst and most tragic circumstances of the human experience. As though He can't handle Himself and He needs our help. And they'll try to convince you that God somehow didn't see it coming. Or God is somehow impotent to keep the bad things from happening. And yet my Bible says, Hallelujah, the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory unto Him. The people of God down through the ages have always found joy in the darkest of circumstances because they knew their God was still on His throne. He had not taken a vacation. He had not abdicated. He wasn't napping. He was still on His throne. Whatever happens in the life of God's people is either caused by God or God allows it to happen, but it won't happen unless He causes it or allows it. And I know that oftentimes you and I think we love our children better than God loves His kids, and if I were God, I would not let that saint go through that heartbreaking experience. That's what we say. We are so quick to stand in judgment on God. And yet... God Almighty allows things to happen. And we cannot deny the clear teaching of the Bible that God is on His throne. It's the foundation of every doctrine of the Bible. And the joy of the Lord rests upon and delights in the fact that God's on His throne. That will bring comfort to a, a broken heart about as quickly as anything I know. But it's not just that God is sovereign. Psalm 97, 1 says, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of the isles be glad. Folk, I rejoice that God's on His throne. I don't always like the way He's running things. I don't always like 
what He allows to come into your life and my life. But deep down in my heart, I am glad somebody's in charge, and I'm glad it's Him. Absolutely. The second foundation of the joy of the Spirit is this. The fruit of the Spirit called joy delights in God's plan in the midst of our trials. Boy, I'd hate to think that if my loved one is suffering, that there was no rhyme, no reason, no purpose, no goal. It was just happening at random chance. I mean, when you and I suffer, don't we want to, to think there's got to be a purpose? Doesn't that somehow bring solace to our hearts? Well, the joy of the Lord knows and delights in the fact that God has a purpose. In 1 Peter 1, verses 6, 6 through 9, would you read that with me, please? In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith may be found to bring praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if need be, points to a divine plan. So that points to a divine plan. When this gymnasium was being built, we needed to pour a foundation, didn't we? Yes, absolutely. We needed a foundation. And then we needed some still structure. So when Peter says, though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved. Boy, that word grieved is a powerful word. Grieved by various trials, so that for the purpose that the genius of your faith may be found to bring glory, praise, and honor at the revelation of Jesus. In other words, there are many reasons that God allows hardships to come into our lives, but one of them is to refine our faith so that God's going to be praised and receive glory at the coming of Jesus. Now, I don't think that's the only reason that God allows trials, but that's enough. If I don't know any other reason that God has allowed a trial in my life, I know there's at least one. He's refining my faith. Because faith actually gets stronger when it's exercised. See? It gets flabby when it's not used. It gets stronger when it's used. The joy of the Lord delights in the fact that God has a plan. I don't think God minds someone saying, why, Lord, is this happening? Now, I do think it's disrespectful to say, why is this happening in an accusatory sort of way? And usually when we ask why, it's accusatory. Why are you letting this happen? But to say, Lord, what are you wanting to accomplish in this trial in my life? What's wrong with that? Isn't that cooperating with God? Sure, sometimes He may let us know what He's trying to accomplish in our lives and the lives of those around us, but sometimes we may not discover what He was trying to accomplish for months or years down the road. And in some cases, it may be when we get before His throne room that we discover these things. I don't think God minds you saying, Lord, I am making a list of questions that I want to ask you when I see you because I know you have the answer. I know your answers will satisfy but I'm going to write this question down because I want to ask you when I get there. I don't think God's offended by that. By the way, if when you see the Lord Jesus face to face and you look into His eyes, if those questions just kind of evaporate and don't really matter, don't be surprised. Because you may get all your answers just looking into His eyes. But if there are any questions that remain... He'll have the answer. And His answers will satisfy. Third, the joy of the Spirit believes that God is loving and faithful at all times. The joy of the Lord is absolutely confident that God is loving, that He is kind that He is faithful and that nothing will ever change who God is. 
His character does not change. Do I always see His love and His tender mercies in all circumstances? Honestly, no. I've been with some of you through some uh, trials and tribulations, and honestly, I did not see God's loving kindness and tender mercies. I didn't see it. But did that mean they're not there? No, that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means I don't have the spiritual discernment to be able to see them. I really don't. Do I have to see them for them to be there? No. Because the Bible tells us they are there. Psalm 145, verses 9 and 10. Let's read that together, please. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. Folks, that is a profound verse of Scripture. It really is profound. The Lord is good to only those who love Him, right? The, God, the Lord is good only to those who attend church regularly. Only to those who act, have their act together. No, it says to all. Even when you and I don't deserve it, He's good to us. Even when He spanks us, is He being good to us? Some of you are not convinced. The right answer is yes. Yeah. And His tender mercies are over how many of His works? All of them. Even the ones that hurt. Even the ones that leave wounds that don't heal for the rest of our lives. Yes. Some of you are carrying wounds that have not healed. And they have profoundly impacted your life. But God's tender mercies were there. Then this is so interesting. All of your works shall praise you. Every work of God is going to praise Him. Whether you liked it or I liked it, whether we did not like it or not, it's going to praise Him. And eventually, when you and I stand before Him and we have all of the answers to all of our questions, we are going to bless God for every one of His works in our lives, even the ones that hurt the most. Well, if the Bible's true, and don't you believe the Bible is true? You will bless God for that thing that you have not forgiven God for even yet. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of God's people are holding a grudge against God. You have not forgiven Him for that. Now, I know it sounds blasphemous that God needs your forgiveness, but you're holding it in and you're holding the grudge and you've chosen not to forgive Him. You will not only forgive Him, you will bless Him and thank Him for that work that's been so difficult in your life. But the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Spirit, believes that God is loving and faithful and that He never changes. Never. Next, the joy of the Spirit trusts that God is bringing blessing out of every trial and heartache without exception. He's working to bring blessing not only into your life, but also in the lives of everybody that you care about and who is somehow involved in your trial or tribulation. Romans 8, 28, And we know that God causes all things, all things, all things to work together for good to those who love Him, love Him, love Him. If you decide you're going to surrender your joy and that's your choice, it's going to be very difficult for God to bring good and blessing out of that. But if you hold on to the joy of the Lord and let it hold on to you, be your life preserved in the midst of a turbulent situation, God can bring good in your life and the lives of others. I like Genesis 20, uh, 50, verse 20. Joseph says to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That's Romans eight twenty eight in the Old Testament. I am so glad Joseph had that perspective. We often think the Old Testament saints were kind of dense, but they weren't. They had tremendous insights given to them by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, the joy of the Spirit really, really wants God to receive glory and thanksgiving. Glory and thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, would you join me in reading that, please? Rejoice in the Lord always, in everything give thanks, 
For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. The joy of the Lord focuses on the Lord. Not the circumstances, but on the Lord. All right? The joy of the Lord and those who are embracing that joy and are embraced by that joy. Their focus is on the Lord. So they understand that life is not about me. Life is not about me. I live to serve God's purposes. He is the master. I am the servant. He is the potter. I am the clay. I exist to glorify Him and to bring Him pleasure. I exist for that purpose. So, whatever trial we're going through, we need to remind one another, because particularly when we're in trial, our focus tends to be on ourselves. It's not about me. God's wanting to do some things in my life, the lives of those around me. But ultimately, this is about Him. And I want to bring Him glory, and I want to bring Him honor. Now, unless that joy has got a hold of you, it's going to be easy to forget that and to turn it loose and to become very self-centered in the midst of life's trials. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's your life preserver. When you rejoice in the God of your salvation and you say, Lord, I want you to get glory and I want when I get through this for you to be able to look back and say, you brought great joy and pleasure to my heart, my beloved because I walked with you through it all. That's the joy of the Lord. That's the joy, the fruit of the Spirit that God wants to give you. It's your right. It's your heritage as a child of God. 